Welcome to the Fly Culture Podcast, bringing you interviews, reviews, and fishing tips. Here's your host, Pete Tigus. Welcome back, everyone, to this week's Fly Culture Podcast. I once shared a taxi journey with a stranger. It was late, I'd had a few drinks, but we soon struck up a conversation. He told me he worked for a charity and that the most important thing that you can give is your time. He got out, and I never saw him again, but I've always remembered those words. Recently, I got a message from today's guest. We got talking, and he told me a little about his fishing career and what he's done to encourage others into fishing. It was too good a story not to, to share, and so I'm pleased to be joined today by Neil Monday. Neil, it's great to have you here. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me on the Fly Culture Podcast today. Yeah, Pete, it's a real pleasure. I've, I've been listening to uh, your podcast over the last um, couple of summers when, when I've been uh, uh, out mowing lawns in my gardening business. And uh, it's fantastic to be transported from a, from a bun- mundane lawn to a lovely river and listen to the fish that you've been catching and uh, the places you've been visiting and, and the great people that you've been talking to as well. So uh, well, done, well done for you for providing a fantastic service for us gardeners and fishermen. Thank you so much for those kind words. I've, I've really enjoyed doing them. As I think I said, I've mentioned we were talking off mic that um, I like to try and do them weekly just so that if people, like you say, can't get to the water, it's lovely to be able to take them there in some way, some way, shape or form. And it's been lovely, like you say, to to meet people and talk to people like yourself via the message you, that you sent me. And I always try and reply really quickly and, and chat to people. And, and the story that you um, told me is an absolutely fascinating one. And I know listeners are going to really, really enjoy this. It's varied. Um, and you've done so much for fishing. Um, and I think it's a wonderful story. So I'm really, really keen to, to um, share it. But um, where is it that you fish? Where is it that you're based? And where is it that you're doing most of your fishing? So I live in uh, Denmead in Hampshire, um, just up the road from Portsmouth. Um, my local river is the uh, Meon uh, and the Itchin, um, but I, I probably do most of my fishing um, at, on the on the very privileged stretch of the Test down at uh, Leckford. Um, I, I run the um, John Lewis Fly Fishing Club and have done for oh, many years, probably thirty plus years now. Um, so we are extremely lucky to have eleven miles of the uh, of the river, and I think it's probably the one of the best bits of the river as well from. Uh, starting at Beat 1 at the Mayfly Pub. Um, that's the old chairman's beat, all the way down to Beat 14, which almost goes all the way down to Stockbridge. And it's a varied water with big open stretches, lovely carriers, um, beautifully run by um, Rob Goldsworthy, the head keeper, uh, Andy and Neil, his assistants. And it's stocked with beautiful fish that they rear themselves in the, in the hatchery at Leckford. So they're all homegrown proper um triploids and, and they're, they're fantastic and i it, we talk about the test and you say privileged and everything else but i love the john lewis partnership for the way that they operate and I, if i'm right in thinking it and i've i've looked at one of the beats just outside stockbridge with the lovely um eel traps and and everything else along yeah. the river there but but the fishing there as well if you're a, a partner in um john lewis um and i guess waitrose as well um that you can fish there and it's it, it's at a, a very sensible cost isn't it Oh God, yeah. Um, when, when I first joined the partnership um, um, as a trainee a waitrose manager um, some thirty-five years ago, um, you could um, fish on the river, and I think it was about ten pounds a day. Then you had to you had to pay, and before that, it was even free for partners. You had to um, put your name forward and be vetted and go on the carrier beat to start with, and then you progress to the main river. Um, but even now, um, any anyone. Anyone who, who works for John Lewis or Waitrose or any of the uh, other subsidiaries uh, of the John Lewis partnership can um, join the Fly Fishing Club, uh, apply to go on the, the river. And um, even now, yeah, the cost is ridiculously cheap for a beautiful day in the height of Mayfly. You can choose your beat. Uh, and uh, it's such a privilege, such a privilege. And does that mean that... Um 
there are lots of members of the fishing club because I guess 11 odd miles, I think you said, is a lot of fishing. Does that mean there are yeah. a lot of members or does that mean you get a lot of fishing potentially to yourself? How, do, how does that operate? And does the partnership sort of encourage team members to, to have a go at fishing too? Yeah, I mean it's it, it it's a commercial uh, commercial operation. Um, so the the you know the the you know, Leckford fly fishing is open to the public as well. So you you can apply directly and um, and fish there. Obviously at, at a much uh, more inflated price. Um, but uh, the um, the the John Lewis Partnership Fly Fishing Club, which I run, has three hundred members. Um, lots of them do fish the river, but lots of them fish throughout the country as well. Um, and we we're really fortunate that we offer a, a subsidy, a yearly subsidy of a hundred pounds um, for per person to fish anywhere they want. So they can claim their money back on a day ticket water, or they can claim their money back if they want to um, fish um, as a as a season rod. Um, and we even pay for their travel as well, their mileage in the cars to get to the venue. So it's a win-win all round. And literally, you can be um, a, a trolley boy in a waitrose working 10 hours, join the fly fishing club and have access to all that fishing for free. And it's it's beautiful. Well, that's really, really cool. I think now you've mentioned that it's opened up. I think I was guiding for somebody many years ago. And I may well have guided on a stretch of the water there where you drive over a, a sort of a wooden bridge thing to get to the other side. Would that be the the association yeah, water there? Yeah, possibly. Yeah, that sounds like you, you're driving over a bridge over um, probably the beginner's beat, beat 4X, 4Y, which it used to be, then onto the main river at Boardwater, beat 5, um, with the famous water wheel um, and then going further down beat 10 you were describing before with the eel trap beat where you go over the bunny bridge and um that famous shot of the test with the eel traps there you know it's 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 just fantastic to have you know probably quarter of a mile of the river to yourself a lovely vintage um fishing hut that's um been made and um and just just the stretch of the river is it, the clarity and everything about Leckford is is wonderful it really is we are so lucky yeah, no, I think that rings a bell now because I think it was just upstream from the Mayfly pub. So um, it yeah. was quite a few years ago now, but I remember doing it. I did a day for somebody up there. So beautiful, beautiful water and, yeah, beautiful part of the world. But you're obviously speaking really passionately um, about the fishing there. And wh where did your fishing journey begin? Was it in Hampshire? Where, where did that actually start for you? No, so I, I, as a lad, I, I lived... Um, uh, in uh, Henley on Thames, Oxfordshire, and um, we used to, um, as lads, drive, uh, get, get on our bikes and go down to the Thames around Marsh Lock, around the famous sort of regatta course stretch there. And we used to leisure for anything that would take take our bait. Um, and I remember um, fishing um, very early on for chub, and my uncle had just bought a, a flat on the river. Um, River Thames just around the corner from um, uh, Marsh Lock and it was on a backwater stretch and the builders were there and the builders at lunchtime were were fishing and we, we went down to have a look and they were throwing um, black cherries into the water and these huge chub were coming out and and, and taking them so the, the next day of course I had to um, uh, mirror that and uh, caught I think it was my, my first chub was about five and a half pounds and it was fantastic wow beautiful to catch a chub on a cherry yeah absolutely that must have been that's quite some story yeah. actually so yeah you yeah. were you were fishing those sorts of areas and then would it stay course fishing primarily or when, when was it that that um fly fishing actually came into your life well it's um yeah, it was most. It, it, I, I didn't fly fish at all um, until probably um, um, I was probably age seventeen, I think, just before I was going into the navy. My dad, um, rest his soul, um, invited me onto to a corporate fly fishing day with his company um, at Avon Springs, and I, I, I remember um, learning to cast and being taught there. And casting out um, a grey wolf right into the middle of, of the big lake, and, and catching some fantastic fish on dry fly and, um, from the main lake at Avon Springs. And that, from that moment on, I, I was actually hooked. 
Um, and it it wasn't till probably I came, I left the navy. I was, I, I, I was um, a naval officer for eight years. I did a short service career. Um, I'm serving all over the place, you know, from the Falklands to the West Indies to the Mediterranean. But I, I didn't fish at all. That's what, probably looking back in my life, one of the biggest regrets. I was in a place like the Falklands and didn't fish for sea trout or um, didn't take my rod with me. Um, but w- when I when I left the Navy and joined uh, the John Lewis Partnership, of course, when I knew when I learned that um, the, the fishing available was on the test, I, I, I joined up in the first year, became the treasurer on the second year, and then was given the job of running all the events and uh, um, all the um, all the competitions. And um, I, I haven't looked back since. Basically, so it's been a sort of uh, a fly fishing uh, journey. Um, from the very beginning, really, um, from the John Lewis partnership, that was the, that was a key factor for me. Wonderful. It's interesting you mentioned the Falklands and um, going down there, and I know a friend of mine was down there, and he yeah. was saying that though these streams filled with these massive sea trout, and that they had no tackle with them, but they would take spoons out of the kitchen and then shape yeah. those into spoons to work in the river um, to at least mm. have a go at these fish. And they said it was quite spectacular. And I got the sense you didn't need to walk that far to find them. No. Uh, uh, and my my last job in the Falklands was I was first lieutenant of HMS Sentinel, which was a, um, a, a, a patrol boat, basically. So we had a um, detachment of um, LC um, Marines on board with rigid raiders. And we'd go in and um, just just visit the settlements really to show that the, 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 you know, the Navy was still there and we were still protecting the Falklands after, after the ceasefire. And um, the, the settlements are quite, quite unique because they, they obviously they've got lots of sheep, they're, they're self-sufficient, but they, they do fish um, regularly for the sea trail. And most of the settlements had big mullet traps as well. So they have big scrapings in the, uh, in, in the beach area. Um, and, depressions and when the tide go out go, would go out they go and actually harvest the mullet in in in, in the depressions which i felt found um was, was fantastic really and uh, but the, the fish out there are beautiful absolutely beautiful and did you get a sense that there was i i guess you weren't thinking about it as deeply at the time but did you get a sense that there was a fishing scene in place there rather than sustenance fishing like you say for the mullet and everything else did you get a sense that you know there were people there with fly rods trying to catch um uh sea trout do you do you see signs of that when you were there i I didn't see much of it to be honest because um in the navy we were you know we were predominantly at sea most of the time um we didn't we didn't apart from visiting the settlements and the, the hearts and mind bit we we didn't um spend much time on on shore and um and the previous ship i was on in the falklands uh, was hms birmingham which was a big destroyer which was the replacement from sheffield so when the sheffield was sunk we were the 42 destroyer that was sent down and we were basically on the 200 miles exclusion uh, limit with our sea dart missile system there ready to protect the carrier group and the bigger ships from attack with our long range um, sensors. So we, we were, we were at sea probably for 99% of the time. Wow. And I hope you don't mind me asking, but what was that like when you were down there? Are you just sort of focused on doing your job and nothing else at that time? And, you know, given that the Sheffield, what had happened to the Sheffield as well, was there, was that yeah, in the yeah. back of your mind as well at the time? How, how, how was that, that sort of being there at that, that extraordinary time? Well, yeah, you were, you were, you, you were very, um, um, obviously a heightened alert all the time because, you know, the, the Sheffield had been sunk. Um, the 21s had been sunk in um, San Carlos and, um, you know, you, you had, at the back of the mind, you always thought the British Navy was infallible. The ships we had were the best, but the Falklands probably was the biggest wake-up call for the Royal Navy in terms of ship design, uh, weapon systems that didn't work properly. There were no, um, you know, rapid-firing um, machine guns to take out incoming missiles. And you know, we, we got a big shock when the when the Sheffield was sunk because you know we we thought our ships were the best, but 
um, they, they weren't. And, um, you know, if it wasn't for the Falklands, some of the modern ships wouldn't be where they are today. So we, we have to, you know, thank that, that type of scenario for, for that. But, uh, it, you know, it was, it was, um, yeah, quite, quite scary at times. I mean, but we, Birmingham arrived down there, luckily, uh, three days after the ceasefire. Um, so it's always a source of hilarity in my family that I got down there too late for a medal. <laughs> but uh, you, was, you still had, um, you know, Argentinian aircraft coming over and it was still quite, you know, you weren't quite sure that um, things were were actually finished because the aircraft was still coming over and it was our, our job to track them and deter them. Wow. Well, and I, I think this, um, if I'm right in thinking as well, again, this is person, I've, I've a sense that it's Simon Weston's 60th birthday today as well. I think I saw somewhere on social media as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A fantastic guy. And, um, yeah, he's, he's done a lot for Falklands charities, Simon. Uh, you know, he, he, um, you know, obviously was badly maimed. Um, and, you know, to get, to do what he's done after after going through that type of injury and being being sort of the the face of the veteran in the Falklands. You know, I take my hat off to him. Hmm. And this brings us around as well that having left um, the Navy, you went to John Lewis Partnership. You'd had that moment, and I meant to ask you as well that you said you were hooked the moment that fish took the fly. Did you, yeah. when when that actually happened, was that it? Did you have to keep going fishing as a result of that? And did you learn to fish? Did you, you know, continue along those sorts of lines? Because I want to segue that into some of the amazing work that you've done. But I'd also like to try and get a sense of your your fishing timeline as a result, that you're back, you've had this yeah. fish eat the, the wolf on the, the lake. Where did you go yeah. from that moment of hooking and landing that first? fish well uh, after after the dry fly take on the on the lake i was really keen to um fish the river properly and obviously you know the river is very different monster from the still waters at avon springs so i was really lucky that i, I was um taken uh, under the wing by a guy called jack crompton pratt who was the the previous secretary of the club before me and he jack lived down in uh hampshire and he he took me on the river and showed me exactly what what the process was you know the the beauty of upstream dry fly fishing um the different combinations um the and i always remember he, he always said to me now now lad he said we're not going to fish you always want to put your rod down and we're going to walk the beat to start with and we're going to mark the fish and uh, we're going to come back to the fish and do it properly and we're going to, you know and uh, from that day i always i always try to do that but uh, i always get very excited when i see a really good fish and and uh, i always find myself having to stop and think oh god jack wouldn't do this he'd be marking that fish and coming back to it but i i, I want to just catch that fish <laughs> straight away yeah yeah um but the the bug was really the 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 the, um, the river fishing and um, the the, um, the the test really, um, and from that you know I was able to um, with my military connections join the uh, Portsmouth Service uh, Fly Fishing Association um, and uh, fish the lovely stretches of the uh, itching around Winchester the Winchester College Beat um, and the the Meon as well um, obviously the Meon just up the road from from where I am now it's a, a lovely little classic stream. Um, seven weight rod with a uh, little hair's ear or, or a, a clink hammer. It's just mes mesmeric, really. And I'm told there's some interesting size sea trout run that river as well. The meal. Yeah, 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 yeah. They go, they go, they, they, they do go up. Um, I've, I've seen, seen the flashes. I've never hooked one. Um, there's some lovely chub in there as well <laughs> for the, on the fly in the meon. Um, but it's a, it's a lovely river, beautiful river. Yeah. Have you been tempted to go for the chub, given that's where a lot of that fishing started for you? Um, a, a little bit. Um, I, I'm dabbling in carp now. Um, I, I was lucky enough for what, one of the auction lots at the uh, the um, the Wild Trout Trust three, three fly that I know you're going to talk about later um, was put in by Sean Leonard, the uh, the director of the. Um, the the trust and it was to fish a secret location in Hampshire for 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 carp, and um, of course it sounded really fantastic. Myself and my brother bought the lot, and um, 
Sean said, well, I'll give you the location. The location is um, where I used to teach at a certain agricultural college. And uh, we went there and um, Sean was uh, ground baiting with um, biscuits and all sorts of things floating on top. And we were in the water and we, we probably had, I don't know, 10 or 11 double hookups with carp ranging in size from about five pounds up to 15 pounds. And it was a, a wonderful day that I've repeated often. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, so I, I'm more into carp at the moment, I think. Yeah, that's a, a, it's been the fascinating thing, I guess, part of it. And again, we'll travel, move on to travel because I know you've, you've enjoyed, um, fishing abroad as well. But I guess with us not being able to travel, that we're looking at other species. And I'm sure you were around when, you know, bass started, pike, and they've yeah. always gone on way before. I know I was looking at them, but in a, in a serious way and, and the carp have come again. And even people we've had one of our guests, you know, Dave, Dave Fels, who, you know, is targeting without the baiting now as well. And people are looking and pushing yeah. that side of it. And, and similar with the previous or recent podcast I did with Colin. And I know we talked about that, yeah. that, you know, him that with the nymphs for the, the mullet. And I know, you know, I started off throwing bread because I just had no idea what else to do. And it's been wonderful to see again. I, I, I think of these things as, I guess almost a second coming because I've seen them before, but we're seeing them come through now with so much knowledge with people having done so much work behind these things to, to give us these, this broad source of information, isn't it? That we can enjoy and go and tackle these other species in, in, in a different way, rather than like you say, us going to the river, catching some trout or grayling, or if we're lucky, some salmon, there are other things we can look at. And I know since doing that podcast, I'm thinking, right, I'm going to go and have a go at the mullet and. I was talking to my friend Perry the other day and said, look, I'm going to go back end of the week if I can. We've had a dump of rain and the river's up. So I think that's probably not going to fish well for mullet while there's um, a lot of uh, colour in the river. So it may be salmon for me in the meantime. But it's been fascinating, hasn't it? Have you noticed this these spikes again in interest in, as I always call them, the more esoteric sort of species of fish? Yeah, yeah, definitely, um, and certainly the, the, um, the, the podcast you did recently with Colin, um, it was, was fantastic because, I mean, I, I, I bought some of his uh, flies from Selective Live um, uh, uh, probably last year. We have a saltwater weekend where we go to um, our John Lewis, one of our John Lewis hotels on uh, Brown Sea Island, um, which we, you know, the, the partnership leased the castle there. So you say, stay in this castle and um, there are mullet on the beach and mullet under the jetty and bass swimming past. And that's just, it's just a fantastic location to try something a bit different. And so all the sort of seven weight rods come out and, you know, there's a line of um, club fish fishermen there. Some are throwing bait, some are throwing um, uh, spoons, some, some are are, um, even putting live bait in the water but I, I, I'm just wading with my fly rod um, and uh, it's it's fantastic to catch a little, little schooly bass uh, I haven't caught a mullet yet down there but I, I don't think I've tried the drift method properly with uh, Collings flies and certainly with the with the dropper as well I think that's what I'm, I'm going to have a go at next time yeah, it is. And as a bonefish, I know you're a bonefish angler. You know, I I wasn't ever sceptical of the term British bonefish, but wanted to understand it myself. And I, I, I think that's a fair description. I really do. And and the, the take that you get from some of those fish, and I know I said on that podcast, uh, one, I, I thought I'd done everything right and it didn't stick, which I think is a common thing that happens in mullet world. But those takes were hard and you know yeah. the, even the the golden greys i caught weren't sizable fish because i don't think they get particularly big relative to the other species but they were still strong and i bully fish in to get them in quickly there was times yeah. where i couldn't do a lot with those so yeah my my humble advice would be persevere and then it is a i can see it's a road to ruin um, but it's a great one to go the other thing i need to do is work for the john lewis partnership hiring castles fishing on yeah, the tech this yeah. sounds like the dream place it's absolutely fantastic oh, it's it, well the partnership has a number of hotels throughout, throughout the uh, 
um, country. The, 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 my other favourite one is um, um, Bala up in um, Wales, where you, you, know, you can fish the obviously the D quite easily. Um, and you stay in these fantastic hotels with lovely scenery for ridiculously cheap prices because it's, a, a, again, an amenity for the partners. And, you know, we're really looking forward to going back to Brown Sea in September. We've got, I think we've got 12 rooms booked for um, club members there. And um, we just get together, you know, have a great time, um, reminisce in the bar in the evening, tell all those stories about the ones that we didn't catch or the ones that we did catch, <laughs> share photographs and stories. And it's just a, a great crack for, for, for ridiculously cheap prices, really. Yeah. Yeah, and like I said at the beginning, the thing I love about the John Lewis partnership, if you work for them, you're a partner. And I love yeah. how that, that works. I'm really into that. So I, I think that's fantastic. I'd said when we were off mic that we would go in all sorts of weird and wonderful directions. So we've done that. So I apologize and I'm going to bring us back now because I want to come back now to, I think the term giving back is a, a fascinating one and, and people do these sorts of things in lots of different ways but you've done it in a number of ways and it, it's really inspiring um what you've done and I, I want to talk first um of um fishing for forces because i know you're involved with that was that a result of coming out of the navy that you wanted to um be involved with that and perhaps you can tell us a little bit about what is involved with fishing for forces and what it does i i, I understand that you're a director of it yeah yeah i've been a director right from the start really the charity was formed um around about 2010 um and it is a one-man band there's a guy called bill howe who um, runs the charity he's um in charge it was his baby and it was really as a result of a letter that was written uh, by a young um, lieutenant, a guy called Will Davis, who was serving in Helmand at the time and having a particularly nasty tour there. Um, you know, lots of lots of his comrades he'd lost. Um, and he was thinking about fly fishing and his stream that he used to fish back at home. That was the thing that really kept him going, his mind focused during that really bad tour. And... Um, he wrote a letter to the um, Trout and Salmon uh, magazine, which um, Andrew Flitcroft published. Um, and as a result of that, um, it, it, um, I think a guy called um, Mr. Robinson um, wrote back to, to Will, when answered Will let, Will's letter and said that I, I'll take you fishing when you come home. You know, you need some rest and recuperation. You need someone, someone to give something back to you. Uh, and then Bill Howe saw that letter and said, oh, you know, there's a need for this. There's a need for us to support our lads. And when they come back off tour, you know, can we provide some fishing for them? So Fishing for Forces was born and uh, Bill uh, used some of his retirement fund to set the charity up. Um, and now uh, the charity has been running, as I said, ever, ever, ever since 2010. I joined because I could see there was a real need for um service personnel to be given something back um by um fellow anglers really because you know i think when you compare the armed service covenant from um, the united states and, and this country you know we we don't treat our service personnel really well um you know the the suicide rate uh is is embarrassingly high for service personnel um, many of them suffering with ptsd many of them suffering for years with with um, with symptoms that you know, simply haven't been diagnosed properly um, so by taking some of these guys just for a day on the water side you know that, the therapeutic effect of fishing you know yourself pete you know it, it, it it's such a relaxant such a stimulus to heightened senses and you know, we, we, we at Fishing for Forces believe that, you know, giving something back to these guys uh, is the least we can do. And we've, we've run ev events ranging from, you know, a, someone might join the website and say, I want to take a soldier fishing from a tour for a day to we organised, I think the biggest event was at Sports Fishing Field where we had um, 45 members of the Armed Forces, Air Force, Navy fishing in one go and uh, Chris Tarrant came along and presented the prizes and got involved and which went down really well with the lads and it was it was a fantastic day 
And, uh, you know, I got involved because um, Leckford could provide some facilities. We've got a couple of big lakes that we used and we ran events down there um, with the permission of Rob, the head river keeper. We, 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 um, got a big suckling pig in and did a big hog roast and the lads came down and fished on both lakes big lunch at lunchtime presentation at the end and it was all thoroughly enjoyed and uh, um so that's what it's about really um last last year obviously we didn't do much during um during covid and lockdown uh but the year before we took something like 600 to 700 um uh, pers- armed pers- personnel um uh, fishing for the day um so Fishing for forces, you know, is still up and up and running. People, people can um, donate tackle or donate their time or come along and help as mentors. It's all available for people to get involved in. I thoroughly recommend and do, it. And does it work if you um, if you wanted to just um, take somebody fishing? Is it that easy to do, or is that slightly more difficult? If I say, oh, I'd like to take somebody fishing, so is it? possible to do so yeah yeah there's a there's a um a, a website obviously fishingforforces.org there's a donate um section in there just click on the donate section and it's i want to donate my time uh, i'd like to take someone fishing on this particular river or this this day um and um bill, bill will answer that and, and set that up basically um there, there are a number of people waiting to go fishing <laughs> There always is. Um, the Gurkhas are particularly keen. You know, they're probably the the biggest um, advert for fly fishing that I've seen. That they're, they're they're a great bunch, and it's a fantastic story to tell the Gurkha story. But there are people that are waiting to go fishing. Uh, it just it's just you know, and and yeah, they they've we've we've sent people salmon fishing in Scotland. That they've, they've gone fishing mullet fishing in Wales. They've gone to, um, bass fishing on the south coast, all over the place wonderful and that's really inspiring and perhaps you know some of our listeners will be interested to um to have a look at the website as well afterwards and you know if they want to take somebody fishing that would be deeply cool i know we talked previously and you alluded to it there that um you introduced some gurkhas to fly fishing and can you tell me the story about that yeah uh, this this is about five years ago that um Bill said, well, we've got some Gurkhas coming and they're renowned, obviously, for being really focused, um, really, um, obviously, fierce warriors. And um, we want to make the day um, fantastic for them. And I always remember the guy, he, he was a staff sergeant now, um, Sammy Maller. He, he's the guy that organized the, the Gurkhas. And they arrived and they were all punctual, immaculately dressed and... None of them had fly fished before, but these guys, and it's the beauty of teaching um, someone who's used to following strict orders and instructions, they picked up the fishing very, very quickly. And the competition between them all was, was extreme. I, th- I think it was at Meon Springs, and obviously the fishing that Meon was, is, was quite easy to catch fish, and uh, they all caught um, their, their bag, and um, they... We said at the end of the day, do you want to take the fish home? Or we cook it's the catch and kill water, obviously. And, oh, yes, we, we take them all because we will feel, you know, they fed the barrack when they got back and turned it into the Nepalese fish curry. And um, um, the next event, there were from three or four, there were 13. And the next event, there were 20. <laughs> and now the, the club has grown. I think they've got 35 members of the club. They've all got their kosher um, fly fishing uh, shirts. And I was lucky enough to be presented as an honorary member uh, with, with my shirt last year. Very proud moment. Um, and um, they are so keen now. Um, the take-up rate is about 50%. So every Gurkha that comes, one in two, will buy some kit and keep fishing. And... Um, that it, it's just a great story to tell really is a great story to tell uh, they are such lovely people and they are dedicated really dedicated that's amazing i love that story and it must be inspiring to as you've alluded to um see people love fishing like you do and then come back and then come back and keep coming back. And are these guys sort of going out now fishing on their own or are they still coming to days or do they, within their club that they formed, are they sort of organising days out in different fisheries? How, how's that working for them? 
Yeah, but they're, they're, they're fishing all over the world now. Um, um, Sammy actually is back in the pool. Um, he's he's a um, logistics officer in the uh, Queen's Queen's Own Logistics Re- Regiment. So he he's looking after the welfare of people back in the pool, and and as they come over to this country to join our armed service, that that he's a link. But he was presented with a lovely rod that was built by uh, Chris Ward, the master rod builder, uh, as a present before he left. Uh, and now he's fishing all the streams in the pool, and I keep seeing pictures on facebook of uh, him catching lovely small trout out there beautiful wild things um he's having a fantastic time but can't wait to get back and fish on the river again that's his that's his real passion Uh, but they are so competitive absolutely so competitive fantastic and have you seen as a result of when this has been set up um fishing for forces that is um have you seen from feedback and how that's helped um armed forces with um uh i guess rehabilitation in some respects yeah um yeah. but that's helped them has it oh god yeah i'll tell you a story that the last event we had was um uh about a month ago at Meon Springs, we had five uh, members of the um, the HQ. Um, they were all, all officers, and they came from Army HQ near Aldershot, and they were fishing on the river. Um, sorry, fishing at Meon Springs in the lake. And I noticed one of them at lunchtime talking to um, Lieutenant Colonel Spike Martin, who's the Army liaison guy that we use. And this guy was in tears, and... Um, I didn't like to pry, but at, at, at the next event we held, Spike Martin said, um, "This the, the, the captain that was in tears was so relaxed and so in tune with the day that he started telling the story about um, his um, his fears. And um, the story was about um, um, a day in Baghdad when four of his comrades were and he described it as being fragged. Basically, a mortar um, fragmentation grenade went off. Um, two of them lost legs. One of them lost an arm. And this guy hadn't spoken about that um, at all. And he was in tears. And Spike said after that, he said, this guy's now getting some really good um, support. He's opened up. He's, 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 you know, he's talking about his demons. And that's as a result of just being a fantastic, lovely place um, and, and by, being by the waterside. Um, and, and, yeah, that, that, that to me is what Fishing for Forces is about. It's giving the opportunity to talk to people about what they've done um, and giving them the opportunity to relax and just come forward with what, what, what their innermost fears and thoughts are. I can only applaud what you're doing with these, and I know there's other charities doing um, similar stuff. And you know, we've we've seen now, haven't we, that um, the uh, how fishing has helped with mental well well being, and that's yeah. been a wonderful thing to see. And I know we've seen it, Jim and um, Jim Murray, who's been a guest on the podcast a little while back as well, has just had a TV series out, and they've talked about it there as well, and use fishing as a metaphor for that and how that's helped them. And yeah. long may that continue, and if people can continue to come into fishing for the enjoyment factor, but also what it, it, it does for them as well, and its healing qualities as well. But, you know, that sounds amazing work that you're doing there, but it doesn't stop there. Um, you also run a fishing day for disabled children too, and perhaps you can tell me a little bit about that and how that came about. Yeah, but this this came about again when I was, um, I think my very early days in John Lewis, I was approached by a guy and he said, I've, I've got a disabled son and we are um, wanted to run a fishing day for his classmates um, because um, they can't take part in the normal school sports day. Um, but we'd like to run an event for them. Would the John Lewis partnership like to help out? And of course, we we jumped at the opportunity. Um, and yeah, I have to say, the disabled fishing day that we run now at me on every September is probably the most pressurised fishing day you'll ever have in your life because you've got probably thirty kids, most of them in in wheelchairs. Um, with one mentor per, per child, and obviously we have the correct number of teachers and support staff for the child protection uh, ratio there. Um, but if, if if one child catches a fish, and the, 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 the aim is obviously the angler will probably cast out, hook the fish, then hand the rod to the child. 
um, and the giggles and laughter and uh, and uh, barracking you get when the fish comes off or, or or you you haven't caught one fast enough or it's not as big as the child next to you um it's just a lovely day so we you know we that it's now in its 30th year the disabled fishing day that we run um and john lewis um you know sponsor it um a charity uh, took over the sort of cost of the day about five years ago a friend of mine runs a charity called a smile for a child um and that's a, a charity that supports children in sport particularly disabled children um so they now pay for the whole day um that they don't mind how how many fish the kids catch um and they have a a big barbecue at lunchtime we send drinks around during the course of the day they have jelly and ice cream or whatever at lunchtime and it's a it's a it's a lovely day um and uh, my my friends and uh, uh, sponsors from john lewis fly fishing club and my other club the real friends come and help on the day and they, they they all say to me it's probably the most rewarding day they've had um fly fishing that sounds absolutely wonderful. And again, you know, my hat is very um, tipped to you and, and everything you've done in your motivation and your drive for these things. So fishing for he- forces, you've t- helped with disabled children. It doesn't stop there. You know, this is the extraordinary thing. And this is why I think it's such an amazing story that you don't stop there. Um, you run a, a three fly competition at me and Springs as well. And... Yeah. How did that come about and what's the motivation for that and where does that fit into the, the charity arena, as it were? Well, um, again, um, it all stemmed from the John Lewis partnership. We, they run a thing called the Golden Jubilee Trust where you can put yourself forward to have um, six months off uh, working for a charity. Um, so I put my application in. I'd heard of the Wild Trout Trust because their offices are based um, just down the road from me, and I'd heard of the, the great work they were doing in um, restoring some of our rivers and um, looking after the habitat. Uh, so I put my application in, and um, it was approved. So basically I had six months working for the Wild Trout Trust. Um, oh, it must have been probably 20 years ago now. Um, but I saw at first hand how a, a small charity, and they are a small charity, but they they really do hit hard and bat really well. Um, they have, uh, I think they've got something like eight conservation officers now that will visit um, rivers, uh, waterways uh, in an advisory role uh, and a practical way as well. They'll 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 help with funding through the EA and other other watercourse uh, bodies to actually restore rivers uh, for the habitat of. Um, the brown trout predominantly um and they do some fantastic work um for a small charity um i can't remember how many miles of riverbank they've actually restored uh but it is immense um and they're certainly flagged up i think as one of the sort of leading charities when it comes to um some of the work that they've done some of the advisory work some of the um, scientific work as well um so uh, the, the the um I, I saw from the first hand um, my main main role I, while I was working uh, with them for six months was trying to raise some money for the charity because obviously they are a charity. Um, so I came up with the idea of um, why not have, um, um, organize a fishing competition. And so the three fly was born and um, it's a competition now that's in its uh, 13th year. Um, uh, competitors, um, sign up for the competition via the uh, Meon Springs uh, website and they're, they're given three flies, a dry fly, which is normally a kite's imperial or equivalent, uh, a black buzzer and a, and a nymph, gold hair's, hair, hair's ear, basically, I think we use this year. Uh, and they get more points if they catch on the dry fly by about three times. The nymph is about one and a half times, uh, sorry, about one time and the buzzer is in between. So it's a points-based um, competition. Um, and it does encourage people to use a dry fly. Um, each each um, beat is pegged on the lake, um, and we move people around every half an hour. Um, and at lunchtime, we have a big auction uh, where people donate fantastic fishing prizes and uh, auction prizes uh, and raffle prizes. And um, this year, I think we, we raised um, three and a half thousand pounds uh, for the charity. And um, over my six month attachment. Uh, through various other charity sort of um, fundraising methods, 
I think I finished up, it, it was something like 55,000 I raised um, during that six months um, with the help of other supporters and uh, other mentors. That's absolutely extraordinary, Neil. And, and where, do you mind me asking, where does this drive come from? Has it always been with you, this sort of drive to want to help people and use a passion um, that you care obviously deeply about to use that to help you but where has this drive come from and it it, it strikes me that it's something that's not going away anytime soon no i've i've i I just i just enjoy through the lovely beautiful sport of fly fishing trying to give something back to the charities to people to organizations and um you know the people i have to take my hat off to the it's it's always the same people that come out and help Pete uh, at different events. You'll see them time and time again. They'll come to the three fly. They'll come to the cast and blast, which we organize for the fishing for forces. They'll come to the children's day because they, they know the value of giving something back as well. And, you know, we have a great laugh. We have a beer at lunchtime. We talk about our experience, but at the end of the day, everyone leaves with a rosy feeling inside them that we've, you know, we've had a lovely day's fishing, but we've raised some money and we've given something back, you know, for people to take forward and, and do good things with. Um, particularly the the, uh, the Wild Trout Trust, you know, you can actually see the practical work they've done from some of the money that we've raised. Um, um, and I think last year, uh, Sean uh, Leonard, the director, used the money that we raised to set up a bursary for um, a, a students coming through Sparshalt College to actually um, put them into the industry in the right place. Um, you know, and you know we 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 raise the money at um uh, the three fly in memory of a, a guy called Pas- Pasco James who was a young lad who unfortunately died at the age of 21 but he was one of the keepers at um, Meon Springs and he was a passionate wild trout f- fisherman um so all the money is raised in 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 his name and his his mum comes and normally presents a prize as well um you know sage are brilliant they donate a new dot rod every year and uh, and uh, you know the winner winner of the poets prize gets a rod and um it's a it's a it's a big draw really that's absolutely amazing and you know you say you do a gardening job and you listen to the podcast cutting the grass the amount of stuff you're doing i'm surprised the grass isn't five foot tall <laughs> Well, I'd, uh, I had to do something when I was uh, I, 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 I took voluntary redundancy from the John Lewis partnership. But because I'd done um, over 30 years, I still um, basically got my what's called benefits in retirement. And obviously the biggest benefit is, is the fishing. Yeah. And uh, so I was determined to keep hold, keep hold of that. Um, but, um, you yeah, know, part of my redundancy money was used to set my son up in a gardening business. He, he'd already dabbled in um, his own business, but he, he now he now has. Um, a, a landscaping business as well as a gardening business and we you know we we employ quite a few people now and um it, it it's yeah very nice to be outside all, all the time something you know, not so nice when it rains but but uh, you, you're normally you've got some lovely customers and you know when i put the headphones on they think i'm just being practical because i've got my power tools and my mower but I, i'm really just listening to you most of the time <laughs> Mm-hmm. that's really sweet well i'm deeply honored and deeply touched by that and you know we've we've, we've covered the the wonderful things that you're doing and i know we talked off mic and you know i alluded to when we were talking about mullet you like to travel to fish as well and i know yeah. um bonefish are a, a favorite species of yours and um you've you've been doing a little bit of that haven't you over the years yeah, God, yeah. Well, again, the, 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 going back, the John Lewis partnership was the catalyst for that, really. Um, about 20 years ago, um, the chairman of the of the partnership set up what, what was called the Chairman's Challenge. So he challenged different clubs, and there were all sorts of clubs in the John Lewis partnership, from adventure clubs to sailing clubs to, obviously, fly fishing club. He challenged the club members to do something unique, and we thought, well, let's go to the Bahamas and, and fish for bonefish and, and surely that will that will qualify. <laughs> so we were amazed that um, it did qualify. Uh, it wasn't a glorified holiday. It was an experience and um, eight of us went to the Bahamas um, and that was the first um, taste of um, bonefish. And I can, I can always remember the first day out, the, out in the skiff, I was right at the front of the boat, two of us in the boat being pulled along and two 
double figure bonefish came down this channel um and of course at that stage i was a real novice i didn't have my line sorted properly didn't get the cast away properly and i'll always remember those two bonefish just sailing past thinking you're not good enough for me are you and um from that time um i was hooked really and obviously we caught a few bonefish then but but um since then, um, through uh, my good friend David King, who who um, runs some um, foreign events, we've we've um, we've been to Mexico probably three times now. Uh, we went to Cuba uh, and Florida as well, and uh, you know fished predominantly for bonefish. But permit are um, my main quarry, and I was due to go to um, Punta Allen Allen in a few weeks' time, uh, but um, obviously that's been cancelled now with uh, mexico on the red list unfortunately so that will be uh, postponed to next year um but um i'm waiting to, i'm dreaming of um the permit again that's a that's my next quarry i think i've managed to catch a pocket permit a small one about six inches long but that's uh that's not a proper fish really i've been fortunate to catch one and oh, i've caught a couple actually but they are a, an extraordinary fish and um, another one that will test you, I think, and I know when I've been fishing with guides on flats and made what I felt was a perfect cast at a, a permit and the, the guide is in the praying position and yeah. the fish just scoots away, not bothered, and just goes on. I think, again, that's the attraction of these sorts of fish. And I think, again, coming back to the mullet, why mullet, I think you may enjoy the mullet so much because okay it's not a a pristine warm flat that you're you're wading along but it's pretty cool when you're spotting those fish like bones moving across and making yep. casts at them and you know i'm no expert i've just done it the once but i've been absolutely taken by it. and i think bonefish is like that as well isn't it and saltwater fishing you've done it once yep. and it's probably one of those things that you're not going to do once, once you've experienced it. And once you've had that first bonefish or whatever that may be, if it's lucky enough to be a permit, that you've had that on the end of the line. That's, again, the beginning of the end, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is a slippery slope. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, you you buy all the kit, you t you, you've got all the flies, you've got all the gear, and you, you, you're you just itching to go and, um, you know, to break that rod down and put it in your suitcase and, and, and get off to to, um, to these destinations. And, you know, in, in Mexico, we, st we stay um, with um, a guy called Daniel who's mar married to a, um, a Mexican girl who used to run a restaurant, Marie, and they've got two small kids now. And you actually, you're actually in their home so she'll make the the the, um, the mexican food for breakfast and you'll have the appetizer when you come home the cocktail of the day and, and it's just part of being out there with a with a sound group of lads all together um and just that experience of um talking about your day and what you've done and um and and it's the it's the whole you know I, I love to wade in um, out there as well and I think wading to me with a guide is 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 probably the way forward because you know you're you're in such close proximity to the fish um, and I always remember um, I've got a picture of, um, on my wall of um, myself and um, Rob Goldsworthy the river keeper at Leckford who who, who came. Um, to one of the trips in Mexico, we're both into a bonefish with a flamingo in the background, and it's just a just a great memory, and it's a fantastic picture. Yeah, they they are a special fish, aren't they? And yeah, it's got me yeah. thinking about it. I've not been for a little while now, and you start to think about those moments, and and that's a great Punta Allen, such a great place to start your bonefishing career as well, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Cuba was was good as well. Um, you know, the the, the the fish were a bit bigger there, um, a bit more active, and I think the, the fishing was probably a bit more closely controlled there as well with the, the sort of government restrictions. But again, um, that that was a, just a great experience. And uh, um, my wife keeps telling me you, you've you've had your once in a lifetime now. Can you can you focus on yeah. something else? But you keep getting drawn back to, um, you know, it's just one more trip, you know. Yeah, yeah. It made me think actually when you said yeah. you buy all the tackle and all the flies and you get into the boat, show the guide your flies. Nope, nope. Yeah. 
Nope. Then he ties and pulls something out. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I wish when I was guiding, I wasn't mm. as quite as polite and did the same. But um, I, I, I guess because I knew some of them would get lost in trees, I didn't mind losing other people's um, flies. But mm. it would always be back to mine as well at the end of the day, which was fun. But yeah. so you've you've been to Cuba, you've been to Mexico. It sounds like you've done a fair bit. Is there a place that has eluded you that you would love to go visit? Let's give you a saltwater destination and let's give you a freshwater destination where are the two places you would most love to go visit uh, I, well i think salt water um probably the place i'd like to go is um christmas island um having seen the the, the pictures from my friend david who's um been there and seen the sort of different types of fish the milk fish and the lagoon fish and the deep water fish very close in um that would that would be probably my dream destination um and freshwater i i I'd, I'd like to catch a salmon um properly um you know i've tried we've been up to the tweed now for um a um, couple of years i'm going again in um in october november um and the, the rivers up there are beautiful absolutely beautiful we were there um last year and um um the two celebrities um White House and Mortimer were filming on the on the same beat in uh, on the Tweed, and uh, yeah, we 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 didn't catch anything. But obviously, Paul caught one on that day, which really rubbed rubbed <laughs> rubbed it in. But we got a fantastic uh, picture of uh, us in a boat um, sailing past as they were as they were filming, which is quite funny because we had a trainee guide because the ghillie because they had the main ghillie and we had a trainee and he didn't quite master the boat and we got caught in the current and were swept down the river past the camera shot <laughs> which to the hilarity of mr whitehouse <laughs> i suppose well he's as you know he's been a guest on the podcast and has yeah. a, a fair few salmon um under his belt now as well and and they are you know it sounds as though we're cut from a similar cloth the tricky fish are interesting yep. fish as, as certainly yep. as, as far as I'm concerned. And we'll be heading, Emma and I, I think are heading up in September with uh, actually another podcast um, guest, Danny Mori, and we're going to go and fish with her for a few days, um, which I'm really, really looking forward to. It'll be lovely to catch up with her and, and um, do some fishing there as well. So um, yep. very much looking forward to that, but I think they're very, very good choices. Um, I would if people want to get in touch, we've been talking nearly an hour now, actually. It's absolutely flown by. But if um, people would like to get in touch with you or the charities, I know you mentioned the um, Fishing for Forces website, but perhaps you could yep. reiterate that one again for us and perhaps some of the others. If people feel they've listened to this and have been inspired to want to help out on something, um, how, how, how can they get hold of the, these charities? Yeah, well, uh, Fishing for Forces is easy. It's um, it's a website, fishingforforces.org. Um, and as I said, Bill Howe, the chap who runs the charity, um, is the main contact there. And he, he'll always get back and contact people. Um, you know, Bill's a real character. Um, he's he's the mainstay of the charity. Uh, and, um, you know, anglers can help out. We have lots of people that donate um, tackle. Um, if they've got unwanted tackle, because um, we can always re reprocess some of that. And, you know, and part of the charity is giving starter kits to members of the armed forces that you know, want to really take it up. So um, we, we do that. Um, the Wild Trout Trust uh, three fly event is all run from me on springs um, dot com. Um, so if, if anyone wanted to come along and um, um, take part in the three fly next year um, I think the date has already been set I think it's the 17th of June um, that that will be on the Meon Springs website, people can sign up come along or if, if they just want to donate something as an auction prize to raise raise some money for the charity that, that would be really useful uh, and um, that can be done via, via the website as well via Meon Springs who um, do a great job um, Greg the the, the the bailiff at Meon Springs is probably one of the finest guys I know for organising events. When I when I organise a got event at that fishery, everything is thought through from the the peg numbers to the proper beer on the table to the proper red wine, um, and uh, he he does everything for me and make makes running an event like that a real doddle really. Um, so credit credit to Greg, you know, 
he does a fantastic job. Fantastic. And the disabled days as, as well. Are, are there any contact details for those? Yeah, well, the disabled days, again, again. Um, if anyone wanted to help as, as a mentor on that day, um, they, they could contact me direct if they want to. Um, my, uh, do you want me to give out my web my email address or? If that's if you want to, it's entirely up to you. If not, people can contact me and I will put you in touch with Neil. Um, it's entirely yeah. up to you. I fully understand. It's probably not the the, the best yeah. thing to put a personal email up on yeah. here, but um, contact me and I that will put you in touch with Neil. Should you want yeah. to do that, um, that would be fine. Just via via um, social media. Um, I guess if you're listening to this, you know how to get hold of me via the Fly Culture Facebook page or Instagram or Twitter even as well. Um, so you can yeah. do that and I can put you in touch with Neil. Neil, this has been amazing and it's, it, it, it's fascinating given that just a chance conversation and some kind words from yourself um, have made this podcast come about. And it's just extraordinary you know people say the term giving back and i i can't believe what you're doing for so many people and affecting so many people's lives that i think it's absolutely fabulous and we use the term good person and good guy in fishing and i have nothing but my deepest respect for you and and everything that you're doing out there and i'd like to thank you um, for everything that you're doing for so many people and affecting so many people's lives in such a positive way. Oh, it's really kind, kind words, Pete. Yeah, I couldn't do it without the help of, as I said, those those regular guys, friends of mine that come every event and come and help. They're the they're the mainstay of of what goes on. Really, if those guys didn't turn up and ladies didn't turn up, then you know we wouldn't have any anyone to mentor and support these charities. But they do time and time again, year after year, they turn up. Uh, the same people give auction prizes and raffle prizes, and um, that's what raises the money. And um, um, you know, long may it continue. The, you know the. Uh, the uh, Children's Disabled Day is already booked this year. That's the next event coming up, which is on Saturday, the 11th of September at Meon Springs. Um, so if anyone, as I said, if anyone wanted to come along and help out and see what we do on those days, um, um, they'd be more than welcome, more than welcome. Thank you so much, Neil. Thank you so much for being a guest. Thank you. I'm so pleased I've connected with you. And um, thank you so much for being such a great guest today. I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed talking with you. Cheers, Pete. Keep up the good podcast. Thank you so much. Um, I think, everyone, this is one of the reasons I do this, that I get to meet so many amazing and wonderful people with so many wonderful stories. And I hope you've enjoyed listening to this one too. This has been a, a great one to record. And, yes, I hope, um, you know, Neil's drive and has been a source of inspiration for you too. So thank you so much for listening to the Fly Culture Podcast. As ever, there will be plenty more coming soon. Um, thank you again for all the feedback. I greatly appreciate it. And as you can tell from today's um, podcast, I'm always talking to listeners, to readers. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much for listening to the Fly Culture Podcast. The Fly Culture Podcast is brought to you in association with Fly Culture, a quarterly print magazine. For more information, please visit flyculturemag.com. You can also find Fly Culture on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter.